The Fermi paradox at its heart is the statement that notwithstanding the fact that there have been billions of years on billions of worlds for civilizations to arise. In the summer of 1950, at the Los Alamos National Laboratory, Enrico Fermi and a handful of his colleagues paused over lunch to consider a cartoon in The New Yorker. In that drawing, small green creatures spilled from a flying saucer, laughed, and carried off a trash can. From that image, Fermi posed a question that has echoed ever since. Where is everybody? That simple query has come to be called the Fermi Paradox. Enrico Fermi is one of the great physicists, legendary Italian physicists, who laid many of the foundations of modern 20th century physics. More than 70 years later, it still drives debate across many fields. In an age when artificial intelligence is advancing rapidly, the question feels more urgent than ever. We hear different takes, some insisting that there is no real paradox, some claiming that Fermi never even asked that question in the way people think. Others say the paradox was solved long ago. With so many views in play, it helps to return to clear, straightforward language to understand what the Fermi paradox really means and why it still matters for our search for life beyond Earth. But in a recent interview, famous physicist Brian Cox has solved the Fermi paradox. It's one of the arguments often used to say there aren't any civilizations out there in the galaxy. It's called the Fermi paradox. And presented an entirely new perspective that has shocked everyone. At its core, the Fermi paradox asks why we have seen no clear sign of any civilization beyond our own, despite the vast number of stars and planets in the galaxy. If even a small fraction of those worlds have produced intelligent life, why have we not encountered any form of evidence? Have no signals reached us? Has no probe arrived? Has no world been reshaped by a visitor with advanced tools? Fermi's original context, the cartoon of aliens landing in broad daylight and taking a trash can, points to the idea of visitation, of creatures popping up on Earth. Yet in popular accounts, the paradox often shifts to our radio silence. For more than six decades, projects like the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, or SETI, have trained antennas on distant stars, hoping to pick up artificial radio waves. Despite ever more sensitive receivers and ever longer listening times, we have found nothing that cannot be explained as a natural astrophysical source. No beacon, no repeating signal, no message wrapped in a pattern unmistakably designed by intelligence. That empty airwaves result, coupled with the immense number of potentially habitable planets, sharpens the puzzle. If other technological civilizations exist, why do they not call out or flash us a light signal that we could detect? As we examine that question, it helps to note that serious radio searches only began around 1960 with Project Ozma. In Fermi's day in 1950, the idea of scanning the sky with radio telescopes was not yet routine, yet his lunch question still resonates. Over time, the term Fermi paradox took on broader meaning. In 1977, physicist David Stevenson was the first to place the phrase in print. He wrote about the apparent conflict between the high probability of extraterrestrial civilizations and the lack of observational evidence. Since then, Fermi paradox has become one of the most searched topics in science. But some argue that paradox is a misnomer. Paradox suggests a logical contradiction, yet the contradiction only arises if we accept certain assumptions about what alien civilizations might do. If we reject those assumptions, the paradox disappears. That point of view holds that the question is simply a challenge to a set of beliefs rather than a true logical impasse. Others insist that paradox remains useful since it highlights the tension between expectation and observation. In practice, the term has stuck, and we can think of it as a conditional paradox, meaning that under certain assumptions about the behavior of alien life, 
our complete absence of evidence becomes puzzling. To make progress, we need to be clear about those assumptions. One way to do that is to distinguish two related but distinct forms of the Fermi paradox, often called the indirect and the direct versions. The indirect version focuses on the various experiments we have done in search of signals or other signs of alien technology. The direct version focuses on the absence of extraterrestrial presence or artifacts on Earth or its immediate surroundings. Both versions begin with a shared premise. Assume that intelligent life has arisen elsewhere in the galaxy and that such civilizations sometimes engage in activities we could detect. Given that starting point, why have our searches turned up nothing? If we frame the question that way, each version highlights different lines of inquiry. Let us begin with the indirect Fermi paradox. Here the apparent contradiction lies between the expectation that an alien civilization might broadcast radio waves, send laser pulses, build megastructures that shine in the infrared, or otherwise leave detectable traces, and the fact that decades of searches have revealed no such sign. In radio astronomy, projects like the SETI Institute's work and Breakthrough Listen have scanned thousands of stars. They look for narrow-band signals that would stand out against the broad spectrum of natural sources. In optical astronomy, researchers have searched for brief laser flashes that might be aimed our way. In astrophysics, people have examined the flicker of distant stars for anomalies that might point to orbiting megastructures, huge constructs built to harness the energy of a star, sometimes called Dyson spheres. They have also searched for excess infrared emission from galaxies that could signal the waste heat of vast alien energy collectors. All of these efforts have come up empty. Yet we must ask, how thorough have those searches really been? The galaxy spans a hundred thousand light years across. Even with modern telescopes, we have probed only a tiny fraction of the sky at the frequencies appropriate to carry an intelligent broadcast. We have listened for natural radio bands, but alien engineers might favor other parts of the spectrum. They might use microwave frequencies we cannot yet tune to, or they might send pulses of neutrinos or modulations of gravitational waves. They might encase their signals in patterns we cannot easily separate from noise. And while we have studied more than 4,000 exoplanets so far, only a handful have been examined closely for atmospheric chemical markers that could betray industrial activity. Most of the galaxy remains unobserved. It is as if we had filled a large tub with water drawn from the ocean, searched for fish in that small tub, found none, and concluded there are no fish in the Pacific. We cannot rule out whole families of signal types we have not yet imagined. Until our searches truly cover the full range of frequencies, sky positions, timescales, and potential technosignatures, a null result does not prove the absence of extraterrestrial activity. That is why many scientists view the indirect paradox as a weak one. It reflects more on our current limitations than on the underlying reality. By contrast, the direct Fermi paradox looks for a different kind of contradiction. It asks why no alien civilization has left more permanent traces here in our own backyard. If intelligent species arise at a reasonable rate among the tens of billions of stars in the Milky Way, and if at least some of them develop the means or motive to expand beyond their home system, then, over the galaxy's 13 billion year history, we might expect waves of exploration or colonization to sweep outwards from multiple points. Even if interstellar travel takes millennia, a civilization with patient, self-replicating probes could send machines to new star systems, build copies of themselves there, and continue outward. Simulations show that even with travel at a fraction of the speed of light, a self-replicating probe could cover the galaxy in perhaps a few hundred million years, a short time compared to the galaxy's age. If that scenario occurred, 
The Earth should already be within the reach of many such probes or colonies. We should see artifacts on the Moon or Mars, or in orbit around our planet. We should detect unnatural objects moving through the solar system. Yet none of this has been confirmed, at least not in any way the wider scientific community accepts. That absence of alien visitors, probes, or megastructures closer to home feels like a firmer contradiction, because our own solar system has been examined in great detail. Spacecraft have mapped every planet and moon at high resolution. Telescopes have tracked near-Earth asteroids and comets, and surveys have catalogued most of the objects larger than a kilometer across. No one has found unambiguous signs of alien engineering. No artificial structures, no glowing beacons, no stranded technology. Even in the geological record, billions of years of sedimentation, erosion, and tectonics, we find no evidence that Earth was ever visited by an intelligence capable of leaving lasting marks. By shifting the focus from sky surveys to the immediate environment, the direct version of the Fermi paradox tightens the logic. Under the assumption that at least some intelligent species choose to expand and leave lasting artifacts, why does our system appear untouched? Of course, there are many possible answers. One is that advanced civilizations exist, but choose not to expand or leave traces. They may opt for a quiet existence, perhaps inhabiting virtual realms inside their own planets, or relying on digital environments that require no physical expansion. They might prize privacy or follow a rule of non-interference akin to a galactic prime directive. If they observe us, they may do so surreptitiously, sending tiny lurker probes that avoid detection. They may leave no giant bridges or starships behind. Or perhaps the barrier lies in the cost and difficulty of interstellar travel. Even if self-replicating probes can, in principle, cross light years, in practice, the resources needed might prove too great or the timescales too slow for most civilizations to bother. If a society values rapid feedback and growth, waiting tens of thousands of years to reach the next star might feel pointless. They might focus on maximizing life in their own system instead. Another possible answer begins with the notion of a great filter, a step or event in the life cycle of civilizations that prevents most from reaching a stage of durable, galaxy-spanning expansion. The filter might lie behind us at the origin of life itself. Perhaps the jump from simple chemistry to the first living cell is so improbable that life elsewhere remains vanishingly rare. In that case, the Fermi paradox resolves because intelligent life simply almost never appears. Alternatively, the filter might lie ahead of us in the long-term survival of technological civilizations. Many authors have suggested that once a society reaches the ability to harness nuclear energy or build powerful machines, it risks self-destruction through environmental collapse, runaway artificial intelligence, or other catastrophes. If so, almost every civilization dies out before it can send probes to other stars. We may be among the very few, or even the only ones, to survive the filter long enough to develop a lasting spacefaring presence. That possibility carries both a warning and a sobering realization. We have discovered thousands of exoplanets, many in the habitable zone where liquid water could exist. Studies of extreme environments on Earth, deep sea vents, acidic lakes, and frozen deserts show that life can thrive under conditions once thought inhospitable. Our knowledge of how life began, evolved, and organized into complex forms is improving. We learn more about how intelligence arises, how social and technological systems develop, and how those systems might transform their worlds. At the same time, our own technologies push the frontier of what robots, computers, and networks can achieve. We launch probes that leave the solar system, map the surfaces of distant moons, 
and send data back through millions of miles of space. In that sense, humanity itself is a case study in the transition from simple life to a civilization capable of exploring the cosmos. Whether or not we ever detect another intelligence, the Fermi paradox has value because it forces us to examine our assumptions. What do we mean by intelligent life? What signals might it send, and how would they differ from natural phenomena? How might advanced beings choose to use their energy and resources? Would they expand physically or focus on virtual realms? What dangers do we face as we develop our own technologies? Each answer shapes not only our expectations for finding extraterrestrials, but also our plans for long-term survival on this planet. If self-replicating AI poses risks, we must design safeguards. If interstellar travel is essential for the long-term future of life, we need to invest in that capacity. If we expect that other civilizations will avoid contact, perhaps we need to reconsider our desire to broadcast messages in our own name. The Fermi paradox is, in that sense, as much a mirror for our own choices as a puzzle about distant civilizations. Brian Cox often begins by noting that Enrico Fermi's lunchtime question, where are they, was almost casual but remains deeply puzzling. He points out that our galaxy holds hundreds of billions of stars, most with their own planets, and life had billions of years to emerge elsewhere. Yet we have found no clear sign of another civilization, no steady signals, no visiting probes, no visible artifacts. That gap between the high odds for life and total silence lies at the heart of the Fermi paradox. Cox then explores why advanced societies might stay quiet. He compares them to researchers observing wildlife. A truly wise civilization could adopt a non-interference rule, studying less advanced worlds without making contact. Under that idea, aliens may be watching us, but deliberately avoiding any obvious signal, out of respect for our own development or to prevent unintended harm. Another point he raises is the idea of a great filter. This is a hurdle that almost every civilization fails to pass as it grows more advanced. The same technologies that can bring great benefits, nuclear power, climate control, artificial intelligence, also carry the risk of self-destruction. Cox warns that when science and engineering move faster than our social and political systems can adapt, any one of those risks might wipe out a civilization before it ever leaves its home planet. Cox also highlights the coming age of artificial intelligence. He suggests that machines capable of reproducing themselves and improving over time could, in theory, build replicas or probes that travel between stars. If that process ever took off anywhere in the galaxy, we might expect to see signs of those self-replicating machines converting matter into new hardware. Yet we see nothing of that kind. Their absence suggests either that self-replicating AI never reaches that stage, or that it spreads in ways we cannot yet detect with our current tools. He goes on to consider the dark forest idea. In this view, every civilization hides in silence because it fears a more powerful neighbor. Sending out a signal would be like lighting a campfire in a dangerous woods. It could attract unwanted attention. That approach shifts the question from what civilizations can do to what they choose to do. Silence may not mean no one is out there. It may mean every society sees caution as the safest path. Despite examining these ideas, Cox emphasizes that no single answer fully solves the paradox. He sees the value of the question in challenging our assumptions and pushing us to develop better search methods. Whether the real reason involves rare life, a universal code of silence, filter events, or signals beyond our current reach. The paradox drives us to refine our telescopes and rethink what evidence we look for. So, what do you think? Are we truly alone, 
Or are we just not ready to notice what's already out there?